So before giving the floor to our speaker, allow me to very briefly introduce him to you. Andrew Burton possesses both a Bachelor of Business Administration from Wilfrid Laurier University and a Master of Arts in Literature from Concordia University. He's been an English teacher at Marianopolis College since the fall of 2010. He's interested in active learning, peer observation, mentoring, universal design for learning, and of course, the integration of AI in education, which is today's topic. In 2020, Marianopolis granted him its Excellence in Teaching Award. So without further ado, I wish you a very good webinar, and I will hand it over to Andrew. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. How does that look, Andy? Is everything very clear? Absolutely. Wonderful. Great. So let's begin. So thank you very much, Andy, for that introduction and for giving me this opportunity to share what I'm doing with ChatGPT. Uh, in the winter of 2023, which let's remember followed the shock uh, introduction of ChatGPT 3.5 the previous November, I was really fascinated by AI and the challenge it posed. And so the approach that I developed there is what I'm going to share today. And that's an approach that I'm now using for a fourth time this semester. Uh, a couple of disclaimers. I'm here to speak as a teacher. I am not an AI expert, uh, although I try to follow some AI experts to stay up to speed. Also, what I'm going to present today reflects my very specific context, uh, the discipline of English, uh, being at Marianopolis, being at the CEGEP level. And I don't necessarily expect that other people will be able to copy and paste directly what I'm doing. With that said, this will be a seminar that focuses very much on practical implementation issues. So hopefully there's something here for everyone. And with that said, let's talk about what we will do today. So three things. I want to first talk about some decision criteria that we might use in trying to figure out what to do with AI as teachers. I'm then going to talk about how I see the various options for writing assignments in this AI era. And finally, I'll talk about the option I've chosen and how I've gone on to implement a version of that. And that will be the bulk of what we talk about. So to dive into the decision criteria, I hope it won't surprise anyone if I suggest a really important one is students learning. Let me put this more precisely. If students' use of AI harms the acquisition of skills and knowledge by students, that use of AI is bad. If conversely, students' use of AI enables them uh, to better learn uh, skills and knowledge, then it's a good thing. And so I think these are the two ways we have to think about AI. Is it one? Is it the other? Is it both? When I speak of skills and knowledge, I think there's various aspects of that. We can, of course, think as SEJEP teachers about the ministerial objectives that the government calls for and that remain relevant in this AI era. I think, though, we may informally and perhaps someday formally think about learning objectives that are specific to AI like knowing how to write effectively with the help of a large language model, or being aware, understanding the strengths and weaknesses of a large language model. I do think this is going to be important because, as I may mention later, these tools are now ubiquitous. They are everywhere, they are free to use, and they're very easy to misunderstand. And so somebody, I think, needs to take on the task of helping students understand what they can do and what they can't. There's one other aspect of skills and knowledge I want to touch on, and that's the transfer of skills and knowledge. I think something we need to be on guard against is students perceiving that what we teach them is somehow no longer relevant. And that's not a new challenge. Let's be honest. I know as an English teacher that when I teach poetry, my students don't think that's useful. Um, and so to bring this to AI, if we teach in a way where students perceive rightly or wrongly, that what we're doing is not relevant in a context where there is AI, then we have a massive problem because they will not necessarily transfer what we teach them into contexts outside of the classroom. 
So that's an aspect of this challenge that I think we really need to be aware of. Now, another decision criterion, and this has received a lot of attention, is cheating and plagiarism. Of course, we do not want the advent of AI to result in cheating and plagiarism. And so there's a lot to say that's valid about that, but I want to issue what I see as a few warnings. So if I think that if we overemphasize concerns about cheating and plagiarism, or enact those concerns in certain ways, for example, by demonizing AI, students may again perceive that we're not really focused on serving their needs because they may perceive that their future involves AI. And so if we're completely against it through a discourse about cheating and plagiarism, again, they may not transfer the skills that we're trying to teach them. Uh, and we may seem out of step, we may seem out of date. And that again, aggravates that problem. So yes, let's pay attention to these issues, but let's be careful about how we do so. Another issue, and this is one maybe as an English teacher I'm particularly attuned to, is the issue of copyright infringement. There are, of course, major concerns about how generative AI may be infringing on copyright. What I will say briefly is that as a teacher, I'm going to allow others to sort that out. Others like legislators, the courts, uh, artist unions, and of course, these uh, dialogues, these conflicts are already taking place. So I'm going to not worry about that in an immediate way, because I, I just don't feel I can usefully uh, engage with those debates as a teacher, except insofar as I might talk about some ethical concerns. A final uh, decision criterion is teachers' feelings. Now, here's the thing. The advent of AI, I think, has made education react very strongly and not just on a rational level, but also on an emotional level. And many have invoked the concept of moral panic. This is a concept that comes to us out of sociology, and it essentially describes a phenomenon where a large group of people perceive a threat, a threat that may, be, that may have valid aspects to it, but they overreact to that threat in a very emotional way. And so again, some commentators feel that educators have reacted with a degree of moral panic. Um, and I do know that because we're very smart people in education, we're very good at taking our emotions and presenting them as rational arguments. So I would just suggest we need to be very careful about that possibility and try not to let our emotions overly govern uh, what happens because there's certainly lots here to feel emotional about. Like for example, a sense of losing control, a sense of our values being violated. That can all be valid, but let's keep that in proportion. Okay, with all of that said, let me now move into talking about how I see the various options for writing assignments in the AI era. So a first one, and this won't surprise anyone, is having all assignments written by hand or maybe on the computer in class. And in this way, the use of AI is not possible. Now, the advantage here is very clear and very valid. You can be very confident that the words and the ideas of the students are theirs and not those of AI or of anyone else. This is good, but there's a whole lot of drawbacks to this approach that I see. The first one is that if we think in terms of universal design for learning or conception universelle de l'apprentissage, its French name, um, we're not giving students a diversity of assignment type. So that's going to penalize students who don't necessarily perform at their best in an in-class context. Also, it becomes difficult to have students acquire certain skills using this mode of evaluation. For example, how do you learn how to very carefully and thoughtfully plan an essay when you're under a lot of time pressure? How do you conduct really thorough research when you're not allowed to access the internet. So these are some challenges that come with this approach. Also, again, I think if we do this, our implicit message to students is that what we're doing in school is not finally compatible with what they will do outside of school. And they, they may get that message because we are effectively sealing them off from the outside world. And I don't think, as I've argued, that is a good message to send. Um, so. What then might be an alternative? Well, another one 
might be having some take-home assignments, one or more, and where the use of AI is possible for students, but where we say to them, you must not do it, it is not allowed. Now, bluntly, I just don't see what the advantages are of this approach. Um, I think if you do this, if a teacher does this, there are definitely going to be students who will try to use AI to help them. And now you're in the role of a police officer and that's gonna take time and energy and it puts you in an antagonistic role with your students, damaging your relationship with them. And so that's one problem. Another problem is that as we've come to realize, detecting the use of AI for writing assignment is very difficult and maybe even impossible. These AI detectors, uh, for example, offered, oh, I forget the name, but there've been various AI detectors offered, for example, by OpenAI. Um, they don't work, they're not reliable. Um, they will give you false positives, meaning you'll wind up accusing students who didn't use it. They'll give you false negatives. They'll miss students who did use it. Also, I would caution teachers against being very confident that they can tell what writing is AI generated and isn't. I've seen studies on this topic fly by on social media, and the conclusions are that teachers are not reliable in detecting AI writing. So be, be, let's be humble about this. Now I'd like to share with you an exchange that a colleague overheard on the campus of Marianopolis back in October, 2023. And they went on to share it on Facebook with the students being anonymous. So one student, two students walking together and one student says, hey, can you help me with the assignment that's due today? They say this to the other student. And the second student replies, I don't have time to help you. Just use ChatGPT like everyone else and you'll be fine. Now, how do we react to this? I wanna say that I'm not surprised by the students. They are, if we think about the student perspective, they are under unbelievable pressure, time pressure, workload pressure, pressure to achieve certain goals like being admitted to certain programs. If you offer them a technology that they believe will help them, then don't be surprised when they turn to it, especially when it's being legitimized by the media, by major tech companies. Here's what surprises me, that a teacher in October of 2023 nearly one year after the advent of, of AI in our consciousness is still giving assignments where I presume students are not supposed to use ChatGPT, but where they can. I mean, what other outcome is there than students using ChatGPT? So again, I don't think this second option of giving take-home assignments where students can use it, but they're not allowed is worthwhile. So then here's the one that I see as being viable for me. And that is having only one take-home assignment. And for that one assignment, not only do I allow students to use AI, but I encourage them and teach them how to do so. The other assignments in the class, the other writing assignments, those, however, are written in class by hand, and the use of AI is therefore impossible. This approach, addresses all the concerns with the previous one. From a universal design standpoint, we now have assignment variety, so we're not penalizing students with certain challenges. Students are learning how to write take-home essays with all the skills that come with that. Um, if you want to do research, this becomes possible. The relevance and compatibility of the discipline and the course with the real world are being asserted. I, as a teacher, you will never chase cheaters or have conflict with students over that issue. And you'll never have to, again, trying to find cheaters, weigh very ambiguous evidence and agonize over uh, what to do. Another advantage of this approach is that now students, again, are learning that new knowledge, those new skills related to the use of generative AI. And as far as there are concerns about distortions to learning and grades resulting from that one take-home assignment, well, the, the presence of those in-class essays helps to diminish that risk. Um, right. And also, I want to suggest that students using large language models like ChatGPT allows them, in accordance with the universal design for learning approach, to apply and deepen their learning in new ways. 
And the reason why this is, is that for my purpose, and this may not be true for everyone listening, ChatGPT is currently in a sweet spot. It is good enough to offer real help, but it is bad enough that it will not relieve my students of the need to substantially complete the assignment on their own. And so students therefore have to do things like thoughtfully prompt ChatGPT and maybe revise their prompts to get better results. And they also have to very thoughtfully judge the output of ChatGPT. And to do all of this, they need to bear in mind the things I've taught them about the kind of writing that they should be producing. So again, this becomes a new way, a new mode in which they are trying to apply the learning that I want them to integrate. And therefore it's hope, hopefully deepening that learning. So to sum up, this third option, I think, preserves a lot of the good things about uh, take-home essays that have always existed. It enables new modes of learning that will hopefully uh, improve students' learning. And it also seeks to minimize certain real risks that therefore make a disastrous outcome in a course unlikely. So those, that's how I see uh, writing assignment options in the AI era, at least from my standpoint. And now I'm gonna talk about implementation. How have I gone about implementing this third option? Let's get very concrete. So a first aspect of my implementation is that as much as I want to let them have fun with ChatGPT, I'm also worried about what that problems could arise from that. And therefore defensively, I've made cheating on in-class assignments more difficult than it already was. And there's a lot I can say about how I do this in a nutshell, whereas I used to have students write essays over two classes and they would continue working on the first class's work in the second class, which would then enable them to get help between classes. Now on both the first and the second day, students can't fully predict what they'll be asked to do. And the work of the first day gets taken away and they never see it again. They cannot change it. And so this is one way in which I've tried to make cheating on the in-class essays even more difficult. Another, what I'm gonna call defensive move has been to reduce the weight of that take-home assignment from 25% down to 20%. So that if somehow using ChatGPT enabled students to get very high grades or created some other kind of grade distortion, it'll be more limited in its impact on the overall course grade. Another important aspect of my implementation is that the take-home essay is in the middle of the semester, not the beginning, not the end. And it's important to not be at the beginning because at the beginning, students don't yet know what kind of writing I want from them. And so they're not really in a position yet to properly prompt ChatGPT or judge its output. I also don't want this take-home assignment at the end of the semester because that end of semester essay in our uh, CEGEP framework is very heavily weighted. And I want that final essay therefore to feature only the words and ideas of my students so that if they haven't acquired the course competencies, they may get a very low grade or even not pass the course. So therefore the middle of the semester is in my mind, the right place to have this take home assignment where they're authorized to use ChatGPT. Another aspect of my implementation is providing a course reading on how to use generative AI. This is a guide that I have authored and I'll show you some excerpts from the table of contents to give you an idea of what's in it. And as I've confirmed with Andy, I'll be able to share that file with you after the webinar. So the first thing I do in that guide is give an overview of generative AI. What is it? On what principles does it operate? So for example, this is where I'll talk about how there's a very probabilistic component to what it produces and why that can cause it to produce unreliable or wrong answers, hallucinations in other words, uh, and give examples of what it can do and what it struggles to do. The next section, I talk about the models that are out there. ChatGPT of course is one of them, but now we have many more that are at the same level. Google's Gemini, Grok2 offered by uh, Elon Musk's XAI. Um, there's Claude uh, that has uh, a version, uh, sorry, Anthropic offers Claude. And there's one more that I'm forgetting, but anyway, it gives them a sense of the spectrum that's out there. 
And by the way, we now find ourselves at a point where there are five roughly equal uh, large language models in terms of capability. And that was not true until maybe six, five, six months ago. Then I have a brief section on how to think about delegating tasks to large language models. And there's a four part model that I've borrowed from someone where one type of task is tasks you should never delegate to AI. A fourth on the other end would be tasks you might always delegate to AI, which admittedly is probably a very small category right now. And then a couple of intermediate steps. Um, I offer some best practices and warnings about working with large language models. For example, talking about the issue of privacy, how no one should ever put anything that they want to keep private into a large language model. I then give some advice on prompt engineering, as it's called. In other words, how to go about writing a good prompt for a large language model. And finally, I finish with very specific examples of prompts and their output that might interest students who are trying to write a literary essay. So I think this guide does a lot to help them understand how this tool could be useful to them. And it puts them on guard about certain potential problems. Another aspect of how I implement uh, this approach is to, you know, after they've read that guide, have a 100 minute class that's all about getting students' hands dirty, getting them to now try to do some work with ChatGPT so they can see uh, how it works. Um, Right, so this will start with a poll. I'll ask students, okay, you're gonna use ChatGPT to help you write this essay. How much help do you think it will give you? And here I've shared the results of that survey from one year ago in an introduction to college English class. So these are first semester students. And what you see in the middle is how they responded at the very start of that class. And then at the end, the after column, you see how they responded after we finished again, trying to use ChatGPT. And what I'm very happy about with both sets of results is that nobody thought it would be useless and nobody thought that it could just write the whole essay for them. Because I think that's both of those are true. And what I also like is that the group became somewhat more pessimistic after the class was over. So I'd like to believe that this class help them see some of the limitations of ChatGPT they might not have seen before. So I, I then share four ChatGPT use cases that have fascinated me, like having ChatGPT research whether or not Mr. Burton, me, allows students to use ChatGPT. And so we look at how those results are very unreliable, very variable. I also asked ChatGPT to write some poetry and we see you know, where it's good at that and where it maybe struggles. I also ask it to analyze a couple of pictures because as you may know, ChatGPT some time ago became multimodal. It now has vision. And so on the top left of this slide, you see a picture that I drew in about 15 seconds in Microsoft Paint. So I upload that image to ChatGPT and I ask it to describe the image and it's very able to do so. It says, oh, on the left you have a person and they're standing beside a flower on the right with four petals. By the way, large language models are terrible at counting. It always gets a number of petals wrong. And then I ask it a more interesting question. I say something like, pretend that you are an environmentalist, interpret the meaning of this picture. And ChatGPT then does some truly astonishing things. For example, it might say, this image represents how humanity and nature can coexist. Look at how the human on the left and the flower on the right are not interfering with each other, how they are coexisting without causing any conflict or damage. And this is the kind of magic that I think when people see, they're simply astonished. It's a moment where you get the impression that large language models can think, which of course they cannot, but this is truly impressive. Then I upload the picture of Toronto into ChatGPT and I say, what city is this? And ChatGPT is generally able to say, oh, this is the city of Toronto. And in this picture, you have the CN Tower, you have the Rogers Center, in the foreground, you have Lake Ontario. So again, it's quite magical uh, when you show students these examples. I then ask students to have ChatGPT do something for them that would cause it to display human-like qualities in a domain that they are very familiar with. 
So for example, if a student knows a lot about Harry Potter, maybe they're gonna ask it to do something with Harry Potter that would require ChatGPT to be creative or maybe show empathy or some other human characteristic. And I mentioned this example because last fall I had a student do this. She came to me with stars in her eyes because she had had ChatGPT write poetry about Harry Potter and she was a big Potter fan. So <clears throat> again, students are really blown away sometimes. Um, I share some key thoughts about ChatGPT in this class. Uh, like for example, the idea that we don't know the implications of this technology. We don't know what effects it's going to have. And that there's no user guide that each of us has to figure out how we can best use it for our own purposes. Um, and then the very last element is where we really come back to our course. I give them a worksheet that has them attempt to get ChatGPT to do useful tasks that are relevant for writing a literary essay. And so students get a very concrete sense of how ChatGPT may or may not be able to help them. So that's the class. And I hope that by the end of that, after having done the reading prior to the class, they've really got a better understanding of ChatGPT and what it can and can't do. Another aspect of my, oh, sorry, I did forget this slide. Uh, at one point in this class, I show uh, students some images generated by ChatGPT or more properly generated by the Dolly image generator that's integrated within ChatGPT. And again, it's quite incredible what it can do. Although you'll notice that almost in no picture is Marianopolis spelled correctly. And there's weird things happening with the wires for the headphones. And I challenge students to spot the errors. There is one picture here, of course, where there are five fingers on one person's hand, a very classic AI mistake. But back to this next aspect of implementation, of how I implement this take-home essay where they can use ChatGPT, one thing I do is I free them to seek any support they want. And you're probably wondering, well, what does that mean? Let me show you. I'm going to read you an excerpt from the academic integrity section of the assignment instructions for this take-home essay. Normally, students are expected to complete assignments independently. However, for this assignment, students are encouraged to collaborate with others and use various tools, for example, technological ones, as doing so can be ethically legitimate and help develop important skills. Thus, while working on this assignment, you may seek assistance from others. For example, other students, parents, grammar checkers, AI chatbots regarding essay wording and or content. Citation of functional assistance from other people and or tools will be accomplished via a short account of that support. See the reporting on support section below. And I'll say more about that in a moment. This may be the most shocking thing I have to share with you today. I am telling students that there is essentially nothing they can do that would constitute cheating for this assignment. You want to talk to your friend? Perfect. You want to get ChatGPT to revise something? Go for it. And what they do need to do, though, is report on that so that there's some transparency and honesty about uh, what they're doing. And there's a couple of reasons why I think I can do this. So one reason, very importantly, is the Marianopolis policy on academic integrity, the document that we call our uh, IPESA, and this is a standard document that every SEJEP has. In that document, it lays out certain baseline expectations for what is academic uh, integrity, but it also says many times, teachers can change this definition if they so choose. And so I'm taking advantage of that permission which not every teacher may have. Also, I believe that the type of writing I'm asking for is sufficiently difficult and specific that even with the help of others, students are still going to have to do the bulk of the work themselves. And I'll say more about this, but I think I'm right about that. And finally, remember, this is not the final essay. There will be a final in-class essay worth 40%. That's four zero percent so if students learn nothing from this assignment, that will impact them on that final essay. And that's something I remind them of. So they have a big incentive to learn from this essay. Okay. 
Another aspect of my implementation <clears throat> is to provide a method, a method for citation. And I'm very pleased to say that the Modern Language Association, which provides we English teachers with our citation method, they were very quick to offer a way to proceed with generative AI, uh, particularly in the case where it doesn't make sense to put the AI output in quotation marks. And I'll just have a quick drink of water and then I will show you that. <clears throat> So this is what the Modern Language Association has said in one of their blog posts. They say, you should cite a generative AI tool whenever you paraphrase, quote, or incorporate into your own work any content, whether text, image, data, or other, that was created by it. You should also acknowledge all functional uses of the tool. Um, I was talking about citation, citation method and how the MLA Association has given a way forward for acknowledging what it calls functional uses of ChatGPT, where you don't want to put its work in quotation marks because that doesn't make sense. And so accordingly, after my students have given their bibliography, they need to provide what I call a support page. And there will be one entry for every type of support they used for a parent, for uh, ChatGPT. They have to name the support. They have to say how they used it, maybe some example prompts, for example, with ChatGPT, and then explain how it helped them write their essay. So in this way, again, there is transparency and honesty about their use of AI. And in my experience, students are very willing to talk about how they made use of the tool. And I've learned a lot uh, by reading their commentary. Another aspect of what I'm doing is to try to create a composition process that fosters authentic work and student engagement. And let me show you how I try to make that happen. Um, so a first step in, this, in writing this essay is that students must fill out a worksheet that is an outline. So they're planning their essay using this worksheet that I provide. Then they will submit that outline to me through Omnivox. And then we have a one-on-one -on -one meeting, me and every student about the outline where I say, you know, yes, this part's good. Oh, don't do this, do this instead. And so by the end of the meeting, we've established a mutually agreed upon approach to the essay. They are not allowed to deviate from that approach unless I give my permission. And so this, I think, helps. It, it forces students to have to do the work partly on their own because they can't just, for example, turn to someone else's essay uh, and then deliver it. And on that note, I also in the instructions specify that if I see that students are planning essays that are too similar, I will require those students to make whatever changes I deem necessary. Because of course, what I don't want is two students to collaborate on an essay together and then submit the exact same essay, which I guess is something that otherwise could happen. So I protect myself from that possibility. A final step in this process, is to offer very rich feedback that students will go on to read, analyze, and apply during a dedicated class. What I mean by rich feedback is that I offer handwritten comments on the paper that are more grammar focused, but then I'm using voice recognition to generate a prose document that I print out and staple to each essay. And these notes are extensive. The voice recognition lets me go quite quickly. And then at the start of a 100 minute class, students have the entire class to read that feedback and then using a worksheet to go through a process of analyzing it and then trying to use the feedback to revise a paragraph that, that was problematic. That worksheet will also have them do things like reflect on their writing process, list any questions they have for me, uh, and identify up to three areas of uh, improvement. So by the end of this process, hopefully they feel they've gotten a lot and this should motivate them to therefore want to submit uh, good work and their own work. All right. Now, in thinking about this process and how it tries to foster engagement and authentic work, uh, I've had some inspiration. There's a joint committee, or sorry, joint task force on writing an AI that has been put together by the Modern Language Association and another group called the CCCC 
the Conference on College Composition and Communication. I don't really know who they are, but I gather these guys really care about essays at the college level. And in one of their blog posts, they have the following to say. Our short answer is that we're not advocating discarding or shortening essay assignments or only working on them only in class or other proctored environments. Rather, we're looking at adapting our existing assignments to mitigate dishonesty and learning loss by discouraging misuse as much as possible through recognized best practices in assigning writing. So first thing I wanna point out here is their, their attitude towards learning loss, dishonesty. They are not trying to prevent it 100%. They say they want to mitigate those issues. They say they want to diminish them as much as possible. And I like this approach. They care about these things, but they will not let them be the only priority. They're very much focused on learning. And that I hope you see resonates with how I see things as well. They mention best practices in assigning writing as a way to help achieve these goals. Let me now show you the list of what they offer as best writing practices. I'll let you read those silently. And as you do so, I invite you to think about how my process may reflect those best practices. I do think my process reflects these best practices and that's partly why it has proven to work well. There's one more aspect of my implementation that I'd like to talk about, and that is designing assignments that are suitably challenging, something I think I've mentioned briefly earlier. Um, well, what do I mean by challenging assignments or essays? In my courses, I am very specific about how students should go about uh, writing their ideas. For example, in my English 103 on rites of passage, I tell students to analyze a rite of passage using four paragraphs that involve 11 distinct steps. It is very unlikely that ChatGPT is capable of producing exactly that kind of analysis structured that way. Also in English 101, for example, the first semester English course, I have students write a body paragraph that has four major parts and many of those parts have additional sub parts. Again, this highly structured approach means that ChatGPT is probably going to fail to adequately produce what I'm looking for. I'm also calling for very precise, logical, and fully explained analysis. And ChatGPT definitely struggles with all of those things. Uh, and I also assign literature that ChatGPT has difficulty dealing with. So, let me, to, before I talk about what that is, what does ChatGPT struggle with? Well, it's good at things where the, the text is in the training data or that the text is available on the internet or that can be uploaded in a file. And what really also helps it is if there's a lot of commentary on that text, because then on its, using its probabilistic principle, it can generate what sounds like a pretty smart analysis. For example, think of a fable by Aesop. This is, they're everywhere on the internet. They're in the training data of these large language models for sure. And there's a ton of really good commentary. So it's easy for a large language model to sound smart analyzing one of Aesop's fables. But I assign things like contemporary poetry that is of zero academic interest. This means that there's the dimension of poetic form that ChatGPT really struggles to work with. There's no meaningful commentary out there that it can draw from to generate an analysis. And the language is highly figurative. It's highly metaphorical. And ChatGPT is terrible with that kind of language. So students find that ChatGPT is very limited in the help it can offer. Another type of text that's hard for ChatGPT to deal with is excerpts from novels because ChatGPT struggles to focus what it has to say on just the excerpt. 
if it's even able to comment on the novel at all, it will want to talk about the whole novel. So it will say all sorts of things that aren't relevant. So these are some ways that I make my assignments challenging specifically for an AI. And the result is students have to do a lot of work and therefore they learn. So there, in a nutshell, is how I implement this approach of integrating AI into a college level writing assignment. Now, how has this worked out? Well, let me share the results. And primarily in the form of a student survey, I won't have the time, sadly, to read all of the comments I wanted to share, but I'll give you some numerical results. So following their attempt to use ChatGPT last fall, here's what my roughly 100 students uh, had to say. Um, so my first question was, do you think it was a good idea that I allowed students to use uh, AI and get other kinds of support, bearing in mind that the goal of all of this is to get you to gain knowledge and skills? And this is what my students said. Overwhelmingly, they felt it was a good idea. 80% said yes. There was a 17% who were not sure. And 3% or two students said no. <laughs> uh, and these, by the way, are my two 101 sections. Uh, so not fully 100 students. So the message is pretty overwhelming. Students broadly think this is a good approach. Um, I then said, please explain why you responded as you did uh, concerning the advisability. And students spoke about how they found that ChatGPT helped them, but that it didn't take the, the full burden off them of having to do most of the work. And so those comments really validate again that students' learning will not necessarily be damaged by using this approach. And sadly, again, I can't take the time to read these with you. I then asked students, hey, did you try using ChatGPT to help you produce the take-home essay? Now, maybe some would assume that they would all try, but shockingly, perhaps, a little over a quarter said, no, we did not use ChatGPT. And I then asked those students, well, why not? And their answer was, we just didn't feel it could help us. And I think that, frankly, is a very fair response. I think the ChatGPT, its ability to help with this kind of task is very limited. And that's what those students found. Now, for those who did try using it, I said, to what degree did it help you produce the take-home essay? And I ran the same survey that I had previously in class. And I, I look at this, and to me, it's, it's very validating. The, the vast majority of them found that it helped somewhat, a little, didn't help at all. For those who said it helped a lot, I read their explanation of what they felt it did for them, and I don't agree. I don't agree that it helped them a lot. I think it helped them somewhat. So I think they overestimate the degree of the help they got. And concerning that student who said it wrote the whole essay for them, I know which student said that, and here's what happened. That student very... I'm going to say naively, really did let ChatGPT write their entire essay. They edited the result very little, if at all, and they submitted it. And they got a massively failing grade, not because they used ChatGPT, that was allowed, but because the essay was garbage. It was terrible. It did not reflect the guidelines I had given. It did not reflect the grading criteria, which was the predictable outcome that I'd warned them against. So the, set, the bad news is that this student really didn't learn much, if anything, about writing essays. The silver lining is that this student learned a lot about the limits of a large language model. Um, and so this is one downside of this approach. It's predictable that a small number of students will not get the memo about the limits of ChatGPT. They will trust it too much, and their, their grades will therefore be awful. Um, that is not an insignificant problem because I could have protected those students from that outcome and maybe helped their learning more through an in-class essay. However, the vast majority of students do use ChatGPT in a thoughtful, appropriate way, and they're learning so much about ChatGPT and deepening their learning of our existing course objectives so that my ultimate conclusion is that this approach is worth it when you weigh the pros and the cons. Again, I'm going to have to skip through a lot of these comments that are just wonderful to read um, because they really validate what I'm doing. And I'll just give you this one. ChatGPT is very overrated. 
I think teachers should let their students use it if they have tough criteria on the analysis they expect from their students. Again, I love this. It's, it's validating exactly what I'm doing for the very reasons that I'm doing it. Um, I want to finish my talk before I take questions with sharing who my guides have been in all of this. Again, I'm not an AI expert. These six individuals have been so important to me because they do possess expertise. Uh, and they also in, in many ways are dedicated to exploring the intersection of AI, teaching, and composition. Uh, if there's one here that I'll briefly highlight, it's Ethan Molik. He is so good. Uh, he is like viral in terms of how many people follow his posts. He has a background early in his career working in AI. He's currently a professor of innovation and entrepreneurship at an American university. So he has that interest in innovation that makes him very engaged with AI. And he's a teacher. So all his knowledge of AI and his uh, awareness of teaching concerns makes him, in my opinion, the perfect person to follow. And he's just so good at explaining things in a way that a non-AI expert can understand. So if you want to stay up to speed with AI, if you only follow him, it'll do so much. And I think that's where I'm going to stop. And let's see, Andy, if there's any questions that we can address in our remaining 10 minutes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Andrew, so much for sharing your inspiring practice, your insights uh, with very concrete examples at the same time. Uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, so far, I do not have any questions in the Q&A module, but I see that uh, Guillaume Bocchiaris has raised his hand. Um, so let's see if uh, we can take his question. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes Guillaume, welcome. So Guillaume Bougeris, I'm a teacher at St. Lawrence. I want to say I appreciate your commitment to evidence <clears throat> like conducted via your surveys. And it's interesting to see like the numbers with your like nice normal little distribution and how your students are sort of like scattered. I would be really interested maybe one day if you have the opportunity to see this like conducted on a larger, more representative sample of, you know, CIGEP students, uh, maybe like, you know, at that college scale or something like this. So anyways, good job. And I really encourage you to continue in that sort of direction. However, I'm curious if you like, I was listening to your presentation and the twist at the end is that like they learn the about the limitations of chat GPT, right? And in that sense, they learn how to write an essay on their own, you know, it sort of like takes them back to square one. And I wonder if you envision a sort of like uh, assignment really where they, uh, where they work like more closely to, with ChatGPT, where it, it teaches them about its ability as a constructive tool instead of like kind of them like taking them the whole way and teaching them only about its limitations in a sense. So maybe I didn't emphasize enough, Guillaume, and thank you for your question that I really do see this as having some uses. Um, you know, I have, for example, there's a paragraph I showed to students to exemplify really wordy, convoluted, pretentious writing. And you pop that into the chat GPT and say, boil this down. And it is staggering how, how well it does it. And of course you need to, you know, think about its approach, but it, it's like, there are some things where it truly is useful. And that guide I give students that last section is all about examples of prompts that I think they can really use and get value from. So I think part of why this approach works is that I'm not up there demonizing AI and just saying it's full of ethical problems and it has limits and blah, blah, blah. If that's all it was, I, I don't think it would work as well. Um, so maybe that addresses some of your concern. It does. You've also prompted me to mention uh, the grades have been normal. And the standard deviations have been completely, boringly normal. Again, which I think testifies to how ChatGPT is really not doing the bulk of the work for them, or even other kinds of support they may seek from parents, from friends. Again, I'm teaching such a specific approach to essay writing. They're really, they really have to go and use their own resources. Thank you. Thank you, Guillaume. Thank you very much for your question, Guillaume. 
Um, in the chat, somebody asks, would you be willing to share the rubric that you used for this assignment with your 100 group? Absolutely, I would. So that's one of the files I'll send you, Andy, after we finish. And there's, you said there'd be a place where that could all be posted and accessed. Absolutely. So after in, uh, the end of the webinar, uh, please uh, do give us some time uh, for Andrew to gather his files and uh, send them. Uh, but we will be sharing uh, the files that Andrew uh, is is willing to share with you by email. Um, Stefan Alari asks uh, or says, great work, very interesting. How is your approach perceived by your colleagues? Did you meet any resistance from them? There were major reservations, no question. And so there was some very intense exchanges uh, over that first semester. And yeah, I, I'd say there was absolutely conflict because again, many teachers reacted in horror to AI and, and maybe still do. Um, and for good reason, like I don't want to invalidate that negative perception. AI is shot through with problems. It, you know, and really, I hope I don't come across as against AI, but I don't want to come across as being rabidly in favor of it either. I've primarily experienced it as a problem that I needed to solve. And whatever benefits are kind of like the lemonade you get from squeezing lemons, but you might never have wanted the lemons to begin with. I certainly didn't. Um, but yes, there was a lot of backlash. A lot of people felt that it was not, uh, it was a very risky approach, but I have won over those critics, I think, or at least um, if not won them over, led them to accept that my what I'm doing is not a disaster. It's not resulting in massive grade distortions. It's not compromising learning. And uh, I think as I've shared data, that has uh, quieted some of the critics. But yes, there were massive reservations and, and lots of dialogue, lots of conflict initially. Thank you very much for that question, Stefan. Are there any other questions for Andrew? Um, there is Guillaume. I don't know if that is a new question. Uh, no, I guess that answers. Thank you. No worries. Um, so if there are no further questions for Andrew at this point, then I would like to thank you very much for being with us today. Um, next week's webinar, uh, we'll talk about the IT Rep Network. Uh, you can read the summary on our website. And please remember that Pedagogy Collegiale is now also available in English. And we're very excited to announce that a print version of uh, the journal will be made available as of this fall in English as well. Um, so I will be sending out uh, the files and information that Andrew uh, very kindly is willing to share. And uh, if he agrees, I will also include his contact details. Should you have any further questions for him, uh, then you can continue the conversation that way. So once again, thank you very much for attending and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andy, and thank you everyone who attended.